Hello, everyone. Welcome to our morning worship. This service is brought to you by St. Thomas of Beckett Church, Ramsey. My name is Ian Osborne, the rector of the church. Our reading today is about money, a familiar reading um, about rendering to Caesar. Have a think about what that means. And um, I also want to talk about um, matters closer to home. But let us begin our service uh, with a, an introductory prayer. It's the collect for uh, this Sunday, uh, 22nd of October, which is the 20th after Trinity this year. Let us pray. God, the giver of life, whose Holy Spirit wells up within your church, by the Spirit's gifts, equip us to live the gospel of Christ and make us eager to do your will that we may share with the whole creation the joys of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first hymn from the uh, choir at St. Thomas of Becket, The King is Among Us. <laughs> I always give a title to these services and the title I've given today is Whose Money? Because that's the question that Jesus is asked in our reading. It's from Matthew 22. So then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others' opinions because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. 
And when they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. So what is that reading about? I think um, in a very real sense, what it's about is Jesus um, defeating the evil intent of his enemies. Um, the, that first paragraph is just dripping with poison, isn't it? First of all, you've got the Pharisees working along with the Herodians. Just think, I'm sure you know the, the background. The Pharisees were, uh, were absolutely not the people who were in charge in Jerusalem. They were, as it were, the country party, and they were the devout people. Whereas the Herodians were collaborators with Rome. Um, these people are bitter enemies of one another, and yet they work together to try to defeat Jesus. And then that second sentence, teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. If that were true, then they would become disciples. They wouldn't be trying to trap Jesus. It's utterly insincere. There's such an irony here. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Are they trying to uh, flatter Jesus so that he loses his head and says something foolish. They're trying to get him into trouble anyway, aren't they? They're hoping that he will say something which can be presented to the Romans as fomenting uh, rebellion so that he can be arrested. And Jesus knows that very well. What he says is so clever. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, we should therefore take this as a, uh, a core part of Jesus's teaching about money or whether the main meaning of this story is, um, is about how you live in a world like this, about how you deal with people who are trying to trap you. But if this little exchange between Jesus and his enemies is setting an example for us. And let's think about what it is. So we've got the coin being held up. Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's. That's straightforward enough. Um, that's the way Roman coinage worked. So give back to Caesar's what is Caesar's. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, on one level, He's saying the coin belongs to Caesar. It's got his name on it. But what you have on the coin is Caesar's head. Caesar's life, symbolically speaking. Does Caesar's own life belong to Caesar? Does Caesar's empire belong to Caesar? What actually belongs to Caesar and not to God? When you start thinking hard about this saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Um, it is setting up a division of reality, some parts for God, other parts for the rest of us. That makes no sense. It's kind of in the job description of God to say everything is God's. So Jesus is setting up a, um, a riddle which invites reflection. And the subject of that reflection is surely that uh, what, when it comes to what we do with our coins, whether they have Caesar's head on them or uh, King Charles's or, or the late Queen's, um, we have to recognise that it's all gods. And the question is, what do we do with it? What's the appropriate thing to do with the money which has been placed into our hands? Why? Has a certain amount of money been placed into, into my hands, into your hands? We all of us, I think, listening to this service, um, have many thousands of pounds that go through our hands over the course of one year. I don't imagine you feel that rich. <laughs> Very few people feel rich. Even people who are quite rich don't always believe they are. Um, but at least in the UK, most people um have, as I say, thousands of pounds going through their hands because you simply can't live in this country if you don't have that sort of money. So what are we supposed to do 
with that money? Well, uh, God uh, asks us in many ways to be his co-worker. That's one of the core truths of the gospel. Having received the free gift, gift of grace, God invites us then to work with him as members of the church to share it with others. And there is no area in which we are more co-workers with God, colleagues, if you like, with God, than in the question of money. We are invited to play a role in administering the world. Um, some of the money that we have in our own hands, we're given so that we can use it to care for ourselves and to care for the people who rely on us. Um, that's part of the common good. Um, if we gave all our, our money away, if I gave all of my money away, then I would become a burden on other people, unless I were going to be left to starve in the street. Rather, God gives me a certain amount of money so that I can live. Uh, so a, a certain amount of money that supports a home and a way of life that enables me to do the work that God has given to me. This is a particular truth for a, a clergy person in the Church of England because we are paid a stipend and given a house. It's not a reward. It's not to make us rich. The aim is that we have what we need in order to be able to do the work. But it's true for all of us. And then we have some leftover. Most of us have some leftover. And what we spend on caring for ourselves and what is left over, they are both equally God's money, ultimately, given to us so that we can collaborate with God. And when we have a surplus, it is an opportunity to build the kingdom of God, to do some good. For that reason, it is a core part of Christian discipleship to be generous how much we should give away? Well, that depends on our circumstances. In the Old Testament, there was a law. You had to give 10%, the tithe, as it was called. And actually, that approach to giving, uh, making a law, making it compulsory to give the tithe, was carried forward into the Christian era for most of Christian history, at least in this country. Tithing was mandatory from the 5th, 6th century when uh, when Christianity first came back into this country and converted the Saxons right through uh, until uh, the last few centuries. For a, a thousand years, more than a thousand years, tithing was mandatory for everybody, but no longer. And I think but probably a good thing that no longer, because we live now under the law of love. The law of love means we give not because we're forced to, but because we choose to, out of love, because we want to help others, because we want to build the kingdom of God. That said, I think we should think hard if the outcome of giving out of love is always that we give less than if we gave because we're forced to. If it's always less than a tithe, always less than 10%, is that truly loving? It's worth thinking about. Some of us could give more than that. Some of us really can't. Um, I, I've, I'm very aware that I am speaking to you about money at a time uh, when many household budgets are really stretched. And if that's genuinely the case for you, then you shouldn't feel guilty about the fact that you can't tithe. Um, it's between each of us and God, and it's a question of love and a response to God's generosity. If your heart is moved to want to give generously, to want to tithe, but you're, this is from a standing start where you have not given regularly to any great extent at all, or you're giving 1% or 2% of your income, then be realistic. You can't from a standing start, go from 1% to 10%. Nobody has that kind of money, that kind of slack in their budget. There's two things to think about if that's your situation. I think the first is to make a beginning. Um, 
if you've never taken out a direct debit, say, to give regularly to the church, then take one out, but for an amount that you can afford, £10 a month, £20 a month. And then over time, try and make space in your budget so that you can give more. And the way life works, um, often as one goes along, uh, circumstances do change and one finds one has more money. The other thing um, is to think differently about the big items one spends on. It's quite easy to get oneself into a frame of mind that says it is absolutely necessary that I change my car every three years. It is absolutely necessary that I have uh, a relatively expensive foreign holiday. Um, sometimes if you change the way you think about the big lumps in your budget, you discover you've got more flexibility than you thought you had. By speaking to you about giving, I want to share some information with you. This is a leaflet that we're giving out in church um, to help everybody to understand where St. Thomas of Becket is up to financially. Last year, you might remember, we did a big stewardship campaign and people responded very generously. The result of that is that on an ongoing basis, I think St. Thomas of Becket is sustainably funded. And for those of you who have put us in that position, thank you very much. Um, there's no one else funds St. Thomas of Becket. Uh, I think a lot of people think there's some historic pot of money which um, can be used to fund parish ministry. It's just not the case. Um, so we came into 2023 feeling positive, but have been knocked sideways financially um, by the increase in gas and electricity costs. Later in the in the budget, in the this leaflet, we've given you some hard information about that. So you can see the effect that it's had. Um, from over two years, our gas bill has gone up by nearly fifteen thousand pounds our electricity bill by about £3,000. Um, and the result of that, to taken together, £18,000 or so, is that we are um, expecting to finish 2023 with a £17,000 deficit, a bit over £17,000, 17500 That's a really uncomfortable outcome um, if we have um, another year like this year, then we will largely have exhausted our general reserve. It's a rainy day for the church. Um, so I've been talking to you about money, about whose money it is and what you do with it, because that was what the reading for the day was about. But um, while we're talking about it, I want to ask you to consider how much you can give to church. I hope that all of your charitable giving doesn't go to St. Thomas of Beckett. Personally, I think it's healthy to give some to charities and some to church. Um, but this is my ch our church. Um, its financial well-being is in our hands as the, uh, the people of Ramsey, the worshippers in the church. Um, if you can have another look at your direct debit, if you give regularly already. Um, if you haven't reviewed it in the last year, we all know that uh, the inflation rate has been over 10% in the last year. So it shrunk in practice relative to our costs by that amount. So if you were able to renew it, that would be great. If you don't give regularly, we'd be really grateful if you did. And um, uh, uh, so if you set up a new direct debit, um, I think you can find a form for that on our website, and certainly there will be those forms in church. Um, if neither of those work for you, regular giving doesn't, but you have a rainy day fund, could I ask if you could think whether you could make a gift to St. Thomas of Beckett? For the church, this is a rainy day. Thank you for thinking about it. We'll turn now to a, a time of prayer. Um, I will pray in a minute for the things we've been talking about for our church and our ministry. 
and for um, Christians as we use our money. But I wanted to begin with a prayer for Israel and Palestine. I know many of us have been deeply shocked by the atrocities, the, the appalling massacre um, by Hamas two weeks ago now, um, and by the breaches of human rights and international law that we've seen from Israel's response. Um, so I'm going to begin our prayers with a, a prayer that I lifted from the uh, website of Ely Cathedral. Heavenly Father, we pray for the many people whose lives have been torn apart by conflict in Gaza and Israel. We pray especially for those who have died, those who are grieving, the injured, those now without food, shelter or medical supplies or even drinking water. Strengthen and support the work of all relief organisations. We pray also for those who have the power to bring peace. May they be touched by a spirit of compassion and kindness. Lord, hear us as we pray in the power of your spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let us lift to God the work of St. Thomas of Becket and our church and of the whole Christian church around the world. Pray for our brothers and sisters in Maui, our brothers in Hawaii, our brothers and sisters in North Kigezi in Uganda, and Christians everywhere. We pray for those who minister in our parish in Ramsey, for our ministry team, and those who watch over the church. For Dagmar, the Bishop of Ely, Archdeacon Richard, our Rural Dean Fred. And we pray, Lord, for the, the finances of the church. We give you thanks for the work of our treasurer, Jeremy, and pray for his work. And that each of the members of the congregation may feel um, that they give to the church, not out of guilt or obligation, but out of love. We pray for those who we personally know who need our prayers, those who are suffering, people who are in trouble, those who are grieving. We pray for the families whose funerals we're preparing at the moment. We pray for those who have died. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. We'll say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we pray. pray. Forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Now we will uh, sing once again.
if you Google on the internet um, prayers about money, there are loads and loads of prayers uh, about about being rich, <laughs> improving your financial situation. I want to end with a prayer, but that's not really what I want to pray. What I want to pray is that we are full of love. If we love God and love one another, then we will have enough. So let that be our prayer. Lord, fill our hearts with love and therefore with generosity. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and always. Amen. Have a good day.